They were thinking more like, oh yeah, mom, you want me to do the dishes? F you, I won't do what you tell me. What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we're going to talk about one of the most iconic bands of the 90s, or really in all of rock and metal in general, Rage Against the Machine. And in this video, I'm going to answer the question of how the hell did this band get so big? And along the way, a few other questions like, did they invent new metal? Were they dedicated activists who used their platform to bring a radical message to millions of people? And most importantly, do I really look like Tom Morello? Yes, I actually do get a lot of comments that say that. It's a little strange. I'm going to do my best to answer all those questions. But first, I want to thank War Robots for sponsoring this this video. Do you like giant robots? Then allow me to introduce you to War Robots. They call it a six versus six real-time tactical PVP shooter, which translates to you and a team of five pilots takes on a team of six other giant robot pilots and you try to blow each other up. Pretty simple, right? But awesome. One thing that kind of shocked me is that there's over 150 million players in this game from all over the world. That is almost 10 times the population of New York City. And if you're like me and you geek out on stats and upgrades and all that kind of thing, then you are going to love that part of this game. There's over 60 robots to choose from, nearly 70 weapons to equip on them and upgrades. So customization here is super deep. And they're offering a bonus to anyone who downloads the game using the special link in the description. You will get a Gareth robot with a unique skin, a full set of weapons, and also 100 gold and 400,000 silver. You'll also get an extra cool bonus, a cool robot and a legendary pilot on levels 10 and 23 if you download the game before May 21st. I personally like how much variety there is to the maps. There's everything from like a castle to a destroyed starship to the surface of the moon. So if that sounds good to you, then download War Robots at the link in the description. Join a clan with your friends and family and get your giant robot fix. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. Thanks for coming out today and here's Rage Against the Machine. I first heard Rage Against the Machine in 1993, a couple months after their first album came out. I would have been 15. My friend Kevin brought the tape to school, told me it was a new favorite band, and gave me his Walkman to check it out. I put the headphones on, pressed play, and I was like, okay, I listen to hardcore and I listen to rap, but this is something different. This is like both of those things at once, and it actually doesn't feel forced or corny. And the reason I say that is because, as most of you probably know, rap and rock had already been flirting for a while with the most obvious examples being the Beastie Boys, Fight For Your Right, Aerosmith and Run DMC doing Walk This Way, and I'm the Man by Anthrax. All those were kind of cool, I guess, but honestly, I thought they were all pretty corny. But this, this was the first time that I heard something that I thought was really like an organic, authentic combination of the two. But what really surprised me were the lyrics. When I read the lyrics, I was like, whoa, these lyrics sound exactly like something from a hardcore band. And what I later found out was exactly how true that was. Zach played in a hardcore band called Inside Out, and it was originally gonna be the name of the next Inside Out record. Rage Against the Machine formed in 1991, basically out of the ashes of Zach's previous band, which was a hardcore band called Inside Out. They put out one seven inch on Revelation. If you're into like triple B style hardcore bands, I would definitely suggest checking it out if you haven't. And to kind of underscore my point about their connection to hardcore, Rage Against the Machine was actually the name of an Inside Out song, which was just never officially released. This might sound like a stretch to some people, but I kind of think of Rage Against the Machine as really an extension of the rising group of political hardcore bands that were coming up around that time, like Chokehold, Downcast, Struggle, the whole Ebullition Records kind of scene. I mean, listen to this line from the Struggle 7 inch. It could totally be a Rage Against the Machine lyric. So to make a long story short, Inside Out broke up, Zach met Tom and the other guys, the band started in 1991. They quickly recorded a 12 song demo, which sounds amazing for an early 90s demo by a band that had been together for like six months. As another example of that, check out how good they were at their first show. So it's no surprise that this is when their lives changed forever. Which brings me to part two, and then they sold out, or did they? After only playing a few shows, I think like two or three shows, they signed a three album deal with Epic, which is a division of Sony, put out their first album towards the end of 1992, and pretty much blew the fuck up. 
They did the Lollapalooza tour in 1993. And I remember very quickly, they were all over MTV. They were in all the big rock magazines like Spin and Rolling Stone and all that. Their video was all over Headbangers Ball in 120 minutes. And within a year or so, I noticed a lot of people at my school listening to them. People that normally would not listen to this kind of stuff. Like guys on the football team who normally listen to Pantera and Metallica. And as strange as that was to me at the time, in hindsight, it's not hard to see why they blew up. First of all, Zach. Zach is an amazing frontman, incredible vocalist. And one thing in particular that I want to point out is like, notice how simple his lyrics were. Like Killing in the Name of, I think only has eight lines in it. He was so good at coming up with these like super simple lyrics that were really easy to sing along with. I know a lot of people won't like this, but it actually reminds me of Lil Pump, who's also great at that. Ooh, oh. And second, obviously, Tom's guitar work. It was just like nothing anybody else had ever heard before. And honestly, I don't think anybody else has been able to do what he does since then. And on top of that, a super, super tight rhythm section. They had great music. They had the major label promotional machine behind them. That's how you blow up, right? And speaking of which, this is probably a good time to address the first big question about Rage. If they're these super hardcore leftists that hate capitalism, then why did they sign to a major label? Why did they make all these videos on MTV that played after ads for Doritos and Super Nintendo? Why did they do interviews in Rolling Stone that would be next to an ad for pickup trucks or Miller Lite or whatever? Why did they participate in the whole like mainstream media machine? Why didn't they just stay an underground DIY hardcore band and play shows with Born Against and Struggle and Downcast? Well, as you might expect, lots of people asked the same question and here was their answer from Tom. When you live in a capitalistic society, the currency of the dissemination of information goes through capitalistic channels. Would Noam Chomsky object to his works being sold at Barnes & Noble? No, because that's where people buy their books. And whether you like their politics or not, personally, I disagree with them on a lot of things, but this video is not a referendum on their politics. The fact of the matter is that if their plan was to use their music as a vehicle and a platform to get their message out, then that plan definitely worked. That said, it's true that probably 90% of their audience didn't pay any attention to their politics. Like the football guys I mentioned, we're not reading the liner notes and going, oh, who's this Mumia guy? But when your audience is in the millions as theirs was, even if 90% of them don't get it, 10% of you know millions and millions of people is still a lot of people. And they definitely did spread a lot of awareness with the platform that they had. For example, the video for Freedom, which I saw tons of times on MTV, was about the Native American activist Leonard Peltier. They talked a lot about things like colonialism and Eurocentrism that were very new ideas back then, like the whole Columbus Day is genocide thing that you've heard a million times now. Nobody was talking about that in 1992. And how many millions and millions of kids became aware of these issues because of something that Raging Against the Machine said in Rolling Stone or MTV or any one of these other big mainstream media outlets? They were on a roll back then. It seemed like they were just unstoppable. The only thing I really remember as being kind of a bump on the road was they had some beef with a band called Downset who were another band that came out of the Southern California hardcore scene and started doing like political rap rock around the same time as Rage Against the Machine. They were a lot closer to actual LA street culture. And so when they heard the Rage line rolling down Rodeo with a shotgun, they came at Zach with this song. Personally, I've always liked Downset a lot better than Rage, especially their second album, Do We Speak a Dead Language. But anyway, if the band had broken up then, if that first album was all there ever was to Rage Against the Machine, that itself would have been pretty interesting. But what's even more incredible is that this was just the beginning. Uh. Rage Against the Machine's second album, Evil Empire, came out in 1996, debuted at number one, knocking Alanis Morissette out of that slot, actually. And if anybody thought that they were gonna water it down either musically or politically, that was definitely not the case. Musically, I think that album was just pretty much exactly what it should have been. Same thing as the first album, just better. No compromises there. They definitely didn't go pop or start writing love songs for car commercials or anything. And lyrically, if anything, they went more radical. One of the main things being that they aligned themselves with a guerrilla group called the Zapatistas in Mexico. And like I said earlier, this video is not a referendum on their politics. And honestly, I don't know enough about the Zapatistas to have an informed opinion on that. But either way, a Billboard number one band, like vocally aligning themselves with what was essentially like a 
revolutionary communist paramilitary group was pretty wild shit. There was also their infamous Saturday Night Live performance. To make a long story short, they played Saturday Night Live. They wanted to have upside down American flags in the background, but the show's producers were not having it, came out at the last minute, tore them off, and they ended up playing Saturday Night Live without the flag. And to me, this is actually a really good example of the line that Rage Against the Machine walked. It should come as no surprise that General Electric, which owns NBC, would find the second song we were going to play that night, Bullet in the Head, objectionable. It's a song which is in part about the media manipulation of public opinion during the Gulf War, and GE was a major manufacturer of warplanes that were used to commit war crimes in the Gulf. So on the one hand, you could look at it as they caved in. They played on SNL, which is owned by NBC, which is owned by GE, which is implicit in war crimes, and they just let the producers take the flags down and play it anyway. So that's one way you could look at it. On the other hand, you could say, okay, sure, but still, Playing that song on SNL was an opportunity for them to get this pretty radical message out to however many millions and millions of people were watching that night. I think you can make a pretty reasonable case for either side of that. Personally, I feel like if you really truly believe that NBC is complicit in war crimes, I mean, that's some pretty serious shit. If you really truly believe that, you would never even consider playing that show at all. So I kind of question how much they really believed that, but who knows. Their next album, The Battle for Los Angeles, came out in 1999 and also debuted at number one. I personally don't like it as much musically as their first album. It's a little too like rock for me compared to the first album, but that's just my opinion. Objectively, I think it was a really well done album. And once again, the band showed absolutely no sign of watering down their politics. Their infamous incident where they shut down the New York Stock Exchange for a little bit would be a great example of that. But anything that intense can't last forever. The band broke up in 2000, basically because of internal conflict. It seemed like they just couldn't really get along from what I can tell. But in the eight or nine years that they were active in the three albums they put out, they left a permanent impression on the world of rock and metal. Which brings us to part four, the question of what is their legacy? Well, first of all, they set the blueprint for basically every rap rock band that's come out since then. I think it's pretty incredible that what they did way back in 1992 still really hasn't been topped. They're one of those bands like Slayer or Pantera where the genre is full of bands chasing the thing that they did with their first album. And no matter how hard everybody tries, they just can't quite do it. But that doesn't stop people from trying. I mean, listen to newer bands like Fever 333. Or Straight From The Path. The streets and, the screens, triple and you might say, yeah, they're just doing what Rage did 20, 25 years ago. And I would agree, but on the other hand, they did it so well, like, how can you really improve on that? And second, I know they're kind of horrified by this, but they also laid a lot of the foundation for new metal. The grooves of the rhythm section for one, but I think in particular, Tom's guitar work. I mean, listen to this off the first Rage album in 1992. Silence, something about silence makes me sick. That's like straight up corn. Fuck you, titty, suck it or to use a more modern example, take a part like this. And it's super clear to me how that was the beginning of what would eventually turn into this. And what's really funny and ironic about that to me is that Rage Against the Machine could just not be any farther from new metal in terms of like culture and ideology. New metal, especially like the Limp Biscuit version of it, was pretty much angry white guy music. And like the entire premise of Rage Against the Machine was fighting against the system that in their view put angry white guys at the top. I can imagine them listening to some of those bands that obviously borrowed some of their musical ideas. Tom Morello probably feels like the guy who invented the atom bomb and is like, oh no, what have I done? What have I brought into this world? My favorite example of that being this quote from their bassist, Tim Comerford. I do apologize for Limp Biscuit. Comerford says. I really do. I really feel bad that we inspired such bullshit. They're gone though. That's a beautiful thing. There's only one left and that's rage. And as far as I'm concerned, we're the only one that matters. I guess he doesn't know that Limp Biscuit, in fact, did not break up, but he seems like an interesting guy, to put it mildly. He believes that the moon landing and ISIS are both fake, so that kind of tells you where he's coming from. And second, in terms of their lyrics, their ideas, did they actually make a difference? On the one hand, I would say yes, they definitely were very effective at getting a pretty radical message out in front of millions and millions of people who had never even contemplated any of those ideas before in a way that I'm not really sure any artist has done since. On the other hand, like I kind of talked about before, I think that stuff was mostly ignored by the vast majority of their fans. It's not that their audience rejected their ideas. I think it was just like so far out there that they just had no idea how to even process it. 
like when they were singing along to fuck you, I won't do what you tell me, they weren't thinking about like corrupt cops or union busters or whatever Zach had in mind when he wrote that. They were thinking more like, oh yeah, mom, you want me to do the dishes? Fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. The most infamous and amusing example of that would be their number one fan, the Republican politician, Paul Ryan. And lastly, the big question is, are they just full of shit? Were they just hypocrites who got rich using communism as a marketing tactic? Well, I don't think there's like a yes or no answer to that. I think that's something that each of us has to decide. That's a very subjective thing. But personally, my take is that they are human. And like all humans, none of us are perfect. I think that they really do sincerely believe everything that they're saying. I don't think any of that is like fabricated or insincere or anything. I do think they believed in that message and then wanted to change the world for the better. And being normal humans, I think that they also wanted to get rich and famous. And there's gonna be times in which those two things are at odds. Like the SNL thing, the MTV stuff, the whole idea of selling, you know, expensive t-shirts and the whole thing with their reunion tour and the super high ticket prices at these giant corporate owned venues. I understand that they have an explanation for that with scalping and charities and all that, but still not a good look. And I don't wanna to get too political here or anything, but I think it just kind of has to be pointed out that their sort of casual endorsement of communism is really kind of fundamentally at odds with the anti-authoritarian part of their message. I get that to Tom, a guy who grew up in middle-class America, went to Harvard, to him, commie is just cool, edgy slogan that he can put on a hat in his next Rolling Stone photo shoot to shock everybody back home in Illinois. But let's remember that it's not that for everybody. It's a very real thing to the millions and millions of people out there who suffered or died at the hands of communist regimes. And to them, it might not be so cute. For example, my father-in-law is one of the thousands and thousands of people who got put in prison by the communist government in Vietnam. And he probably would have died in there if he didn't manage to break out, escape Vietnam, and bring their family to America. When you say re-education camp, that's the term the communist government used. For us, it was truly a prison. All of that being said, I do give them the benefit of the doubt. I think that they are sincere. I think they really do believe what they're saying. They may not be 100% consistent all the time. They're certainly not perfect. I mean, who is? They're human beings who fall prey to vanity and ego and greed, just like the rest of us. And I think if you put any of us under the microscope and made us pass that same kind of purity test, I think all of us would probably fail it too. So all of that being said, I think they did just about as good of a job as any Anybody possibly could at what they were trying to do at being a giant mega famous billboard number one band and putting a radical political message out there and on the musical side well I would still say that they did rap rock better than anybody ever has or probably ever will to me they are the standard all right, my friends, that does it for this video about Rage Against the Machine. Let me know what you think in the comments. I would ask that you please keep it respectful. I know there's a lot of kind of hot button political things that go along with this one, but please be respectful and nice to each other. I hope that we can have a thoughtful, informed discussion about this rather than calling each other names and being shitty. Before I let you go, if you haven't, please check out the Punk Rock NBA podcast. There's a link to that in the description. Number two, if you want to talk about business with me, connect with me on LinkedIn. I've been publishing a lot there lately. There's a link to that in the description as well. And lastly, I would like to thank everyone who supports us on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the True Cult level or above. I'm very sincerely grateful for your support. I never take any of you for granted. Anybody who pledges at any level, I appreciate it. It is because of your support that we're able to do a lot of things here on the show but especially the podcast. I was able to hire a producer and editor with your support. Patrons get access to every podcast a week early. There's an opportunity to have me review your band or podcast or YouTube channel or anything else that you want to send my way. So if that sounds interesting to you, check out the Patreon at the link in the description. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.